Hey everybody, my name is Jim Farmer. I'm an arts reporter for Georgia Voice. I'm also the festival director of Out on Film, Atlanta's LGBTQ Film Festival. Um, the new series Pride is a six part documentary series chronicling the struggle for LGBTQ civil rights in America from the 1950s through the 2000s. Seven renowned LGBTQ directors explore heroic and heartbreaking stories that define us as a nation. Pride is airing on FX right now and is soon headed to FX on Hulu. I am very honored and excited to be welcome one of the directors, the legendary Cheryl Dunyay. Cheryl, thank you so much for joining us today. Well, you're welcome. So happy I'm, to be here. I'm so excited to talk to you. Now, how did this series come up for you? Well, a long time kind of friend, producer, Christine Bashan, yeah. um, who I've always wanted to work with, um, you know, just tapped me and said, which, you know, which decade, you know, which ones were already filled and which decade mm -hmm. you want. And I said, I'll take the 70s, of course. Okay. So um, that it was that simple. But I think it was more um, conscientious of me to a lover of archives to know that this is this is the the, the decade filled with an archive that really hasn't been explored. So I wanted to dig into that archive and uh, those uh, events, because I think they're very personal and very um, moving and um, still alive, really. I've seen all the episodes. It's, it's an extraordinary series, and congratulations for being involved. Yeah, Your I know episodes. we shot at, in Atlanta um, about uh, some events that went on in the 70s there. I, I forgot what the... Uh, the group was, but there was a, uh, Anita Bryant had come and uh, I think there was a, a big protest there and it didn't make the cut, but um, we were at the Eagle there and um, uh, yeah, had a group of folks talking about, you know, what happened then. I was going to ask you about that later, but yeah, I, I read about it that you were there. So I was looking for a bit, yeah, but apparently it did get cut, but I mean, yeah, I did hear that you were here filming, so. Yeah, no, there was so, I mean, Look, the 70s are, again, it's an archive that has not been explored. It's full. Um, it, there's so many stories to, you know, evolve from this decade, so many exactly. avenues and ways to take it. So I, you know, I took it from the beginning of Pride as, um, of the 70s as being a march, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, in LA and New York um, and um, in San Francisco as well. Um, and then it led to this, that, you know, thousands and thousands of people uh, marching on Washington. So I, I cornered the, the the episodes that way and kind of just went in to fill in the middle and try to think of who would best, who who was there, you know, that I that I cared about. And um, uh, two of my icons, Barbara Hammer and uh, Audre Lorde was there. And uh, so I, I focused on them and used them as a mechanism to so the story tell about you know all the events. Sure, the episode is titled "1970s: The The Vanguard of Struggle." I want to ask you specifically about figures such as Barbara Hammer and Audra Lorde and what they meant to you. Yeah, Audra. I mean, she. I, I did get to see her speak once at a conference in the early '90s before she passed. Um, I mean, she really was the first person who I saw use multiple terms to describe themselves and say that they were all equal. Um, black, lesbian, you know, woman, mother, you know, et cetera. I'm not quoting it exactly mm -hmm. right, but she considered each of those parts, of, you know, the lens that she looked through and, and you can't deny them. And for, for, you know, for us to kind of uh, make you to act one way or another way, I'm, 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 I'm speaking and creating from all those parts. So she was sure. that for me. Um, her book Zombie was amazing and, you know, a gift to my uh, young baby like so. And then when I started making work, I ran into immediately, uh, I think she probably came to visit my uh, grad school, Rutgers in New Brunswick, Mason Grove School of the Arts was, was Barbara Hammer. And uh, I started making work and, you know, we were at maybe a film festival together and mm -hmm. uh, she was, we were friends ever since. So yeah. um, very personal for me. And great. You're able to to capture so much in this episode. As you mentioned, you talk about Barbara Hammer, Audre Lorde. You also were able to talk about Phyllis Shafley and Nita Bryan as well. Yes, yes. Or, or, you know, every every uh, show always needs an antagonist. <laughs> these, these were the folks who were there who, 
you know, and, and, you know, they laid the groundwork for what we're still struggling with, which is the Christian right. And exactly. um, I would even say, you know, th this concept of the bathroom and it's now, you know, moved on to a conversation about um, trans folks in, in the bathroom. Um, but yeah, it definitely, um, you know, they were as uh, grassroots and organizing as the, you know, LGBTQ activists were grassroots and organizing. So you see two sides um, sort of start forming. And, and I, I think they, they, this is, uh, the seventies is, um, uh, you know, not to say that we, you know, I, I'm a, a fan of, of, of those groups and those people, but this is the first time we start to see, you know, the, 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 the Christian right, the, um, uh, really become, uh, organized, um, as well as our community, you know? So I, I, I just, you know, wanted to folks to see how, how, relevant that was still today. Exactly. Cheryl, why do you think now is the right time for this series? Well, I think this is the right time with so many social justice um, issues frothing up from uh, every walk of life, every, you know, um, all, all these hashtags and, and, um, you know, other social justice concerns, especially about voting in the South. I mean, yeah. you're in Atlanta, right? Um, I mean, we have to really recognize what can be easily taken away from us and um, uh, around um, issues of Black Lives Mattering and uh, to make all lives matter. I mean, we're still dealing with the same struggle, but this is kind of the first moment where we actually put language to it and um, uh, we're able to, you know, um, respect each other's differences. I mean, I think after the 60s, um, you know, the L LGBTQ community was able to kind of look at that mobilization and, and bring it into the, you know, the way we were organizing, how to cr create community. And I think that's what's really going to, you know, happen right now. I mean, I'm, I'm so glad that the last administration has left, um, but they left some damage. And uh, I think the, the, this decade, uh, the 70s, is one to look at about how to create culture and create community again. This, this really is, is a an all-star team of directors making this. Can you talk briefly about the other directors that, that are part of this wonderful series? Yeah, I think that um, uh, Tom is a wonderful, Tom Kalen is also a friend of mine and he definitely is somebody who has a nostalgia for, for at least the 30s, 40s and 50s with his early work swoon. I think every director in this, um, Yance Ford, um, you know, and all the other directors are, were chosen because they, and we were chosen because we um, created our own sort of form of storytelling mm -hmm. um, and, you know, unabashedly created works that became lauded and, you know, we put our funk on them. So what a perfect, you know, team to come and, and, and put their funk on a decade. So I think that's really what was magical and, and different ways of telling stories. I mean, exactly, I yeah. chose to, um, you know, do my sort of signature watermelon woman style where, you know, I'm in the piece, you know, hear me speak, you, you see what I, you know, you see clips from films and uh, you see, you know, real archival footage. I didn't actually make archival footage like I did in the watermelon woman, but I definitely, you know, Tom did, um, but, uh, you know, so you, so everybody used different strategies. There's animation. There's, um, you know, just just wonderful things that that I don't want to give away what's 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 to come. But there's so many great great you know styles, um, and it just makes it so unique and fresh. And um, as as all walks of you know LGBTQ life have have transitioned and changed, mm -hmm. um, these each director sort of represents their time period. Exactly. Can you talk, I mean, I, I, we could talk about the watermelon woman for hours and hours and hours, but can you talk a little bit about how that changed your career? Yeah, the watermelon woman changed my career in, you know, many different ways. Um, yeah. I think that the, um, it gave me the, uh, with not finding anybody who wanted to make it when I was originally conceiving it, um, it gave me the, the strength and the, the, you know, the skin to just do it myself. Mm -hmm. um, and I think as a young person who's, you know, having an idea um, and we, we're always waiting to, you know, get permission to do something. And, you know, I just, that piece, you know, 
made me realize I don't need to wait for permission anymore. Mm -hmm. And so I have to remember this as I move through these episodic doors mm -hmm. that, you know, I might be, you know, on somebody else's show, but I have my own mission and I could do my own, you know, work. I put my own funk on it, you know, and how to kind of, you know, do that. So that, that, that strength that I, that muscle that I got in, in making the watermelon woman um, and capturing so many lives of people that I, you know, cherish. I just put my whole cultural community in it, from Camille Paglia to Toshi Reagan. And um, uh, I did an episode of a two, three episodes of a show called David Makes Man. Um, and I brought Toshi back and, and, and put Toshi in, in my episode there. So it just keeps on flowing. Um, and, and the woman who shot my episode of Pride um, Michelle Crenshaw shot the watermelon woman. So it's it's that, like we, we have our cultural community and we have to use them. We have to use each other's creativity in, in great ways. And the watermelon woman really got me to realize that we have everything we need right now. So just exactly. do it, you know? So I, I don't, don't go outside. You have everything you need right inside of you in your community, take advantage of it. You talked a little bit about my next question, but, but can you talk about the lasting legacy of the film and the fact that it opens so many doors for other people? Yeah, I think the lasting effect of The Watermelon Woman was really about that last quote that I said or uh, um, put on the screen. You know, sometimes you have to create your, your own fiction. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you have to create your own his history. The Watermelon Woman is fiction. And um, it, it just liberated everybody. Like at the end of that, it you know, people just don't know anymore what to believe or what not to believe or or what they can create. Um, so I think I pulled the, you know, the, the, the chains off of so many people who are not from our community, um, who are creative to really think like, you know, wow, if I have to do it myself, you know? So I think that's the big legacy as well as putting, you know, a big spotlight on, um, gay Hollywood um, back in the, the 30s, 40s, and 50s and creating this timeline of what wasn't there that wasn't recorded because nobody really cared about these folks. Um, there's, you know, there's sprinklings in like Jet Magazine and, and whatnot. But when I went to Vito Russo's book, The Cellular Closet, and looked for um, Black uh, performers from that time period, there was no one listed. And I'm like, that's, there's two in 20. There's got to be somebody. <laughs> Um, and then when I looked in the black film book, Tom, uh, Thomas Bo uh, Bogle's, Thomas Coons, Mulatto, Mammies and Bucks, Donald Bogle's book, um, I, there was no real reference to um, LGBTQ of color performers. So I just said, I'm just gonna make it up, right? <laughs> and that's really what I did. And I think that is that courage, that legacy that we can use what's not there in ourselves and in the world and, and make it and, and create that. So that, I think that's my gift to um, all, you know, talented people or people with the spark of imagination and dreams to, you know, go out and, and do them and create them and make, fill the world up. Great. I, I, I read a quote from you that I wanted to ask you about. Um, the quote says that the filmmaking culture that produced the watermelon woman no longer exists. Um, do you think a film like the watermelon woman could be made today? Well, um, sure. I think, you know, the kind of, I, I shot on 16 millimeter film and I scraped together. I did sort of the first, um, you know, GoFundMe campaigns by asking people without that. Um, there were telephones and no cell phones. There was waiting, <laughs> uh, things of that nature. Um, you know, so technology is different. I think sure. so that that's one big aspect. Um, but the 40 year old virgin uh, a version is a film that's in that vein where, you know, exactly. somebody took that and, and made themselves and created themselves and put a lens on their life in, in New York and at 40. Um, so aspects of the storytelling, because it's a classic story of finding yourself and finding yourself in the middle of, of your life and not at the, you know, not coming out at, you know, as a young person, so many films and characters we're seeing on all over Netflix is this so sort of young person's coming out, but coming out in uh, the middle of your life is something that I, I really wanted to, um, you know, not touch on in The Watermelon Woman, but uh, encourage people to think about like your life could have many lives. Um, because I, I wanted to see somebody who was already out sure. um, and not coming out, 
and how we live our lives and how we have friendships and how we date and, and things like that. So, you know, that's really um, what I, I, I don't think we, we get enough of right now. I mean, I think, you know, Pose probably offered a lot. Um, there are many other shows, Master of None, you know, whatever. There's, there's just so much content. There's superheroes now happening, but there's nothing just about simple life and simple life of color and, and, and being able to kind of challenge those colors and say those things about different people and, and, and being respectful or disrespectful. Um, and as well as kind of keeping that secret community that we, we cherish as LGBTQ people. And now it's everywhere. So there's, there's definitely a lot of stuff that um, uh, wouldn't, you know, we can't bring back we, uh, about how the culture of the world that was made. We could do the same storytelling, but we can't sort of bring back the, the intimacy and the, 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 again, that kind of secret society of, 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 of queer folks that, um, that made the, these, these films in my sure. film. Representation is something that we talk about a lot in our community. Why is it so important these days to not only have LGBTQ performers in front of the camera, but these same LGBT people behind the camera, directing, writing, telling, ha having our stories be told by our, our, you know, our community? Yeah, I think it's so important. I mean, I'm now in the episodic world where, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's very much about unions. It's very much about, you know, you know, a kind of boys club, a father son club, uh, you know, father, grandfather, son, you, you see this, you, you, these, these people that are behind the camera, um, not looking like us at all. Um, and there's, you know, and then you see like the people that are like looking like us, either as the performers, or are the people who are cleaning up the sets. So, um, there's a huge disparity around that. And I think um, one person, there's many campaigns to do that, but uh, Ava DuVernay is actually doing a, a, a campaign online with her Array um, uh, production company where you can go put your resume up and your, you know, your creds and, and try to find work that way and, and trying to get folks of color behind you know, as, as sound you know, uh, recordists or as editors, as you know, so many other aspects of, of production that aren't just about being a writer and director. Sure. So I think we need to, you know, revolutionize that world. Sure. sure. You, you've done quite a number of episodes of Queen Sugar. Can you just talk briefly about that experience? Yeah, Queen Sugar was great. I mean, it was my, you know, uh, first episodic uh, moment in 2017. Um, it's just a family. Uh, mm -hmm. Ava has created a, a set that's about the family in front and behind the camera of the cast. Um, but it, uh, the storytelling is just very authentic and, and, and real and everybody's really invested in, in you know, um, where the story takes place, how the story is told. I mean, we actually shot on, you know, a real plantation. So, I mean, you feel those bones uh, and you feel those ghosts as we kind of navigate what we are trying to, you know, do or, or narrativize and create. So that, that's really magical. Oh, great. I think I read somewhere that we showed Black is Blue at our festival uh, mm -hmm. whenever it came out. Did I read that you're making a feature link version of that? Struggling to, yes. Okay. I mean, it's very hard right now with, with episodic being so exactly. dominant, but yes, the something radically different. Um, but definitely I wanted to uh, work with that uh, story again about a Black trans man. We don't see enough Black trans men exactly. as leads in narrative. Um, in, in features. So um, uh, I think I'm working right now on a show called Umbrella Academy um, with Elliot Page, who just came out um, as trans, and he's a great guy. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but we're not seeing that, you know, everywhere. I mean, I think there's a few other actors who are trans. I think there's one in David Makes Man, there's one on uh, a firefighter show as well. Um, and uh, but we, we're not seeing them in features so much. So I'd love to see that as well as feature world really kind of take a, a turn to incorporate more you know, diversity in, in, in who their cast is, their leads and what exactly. their storylines are. Exactly, what are some other projects you're working on? Oh yeah, um, I just wrapped on um, Umbrella Academy and um, I just, I'm gonna start next week, a new show called Why? Colin, The Last Man, okay. another graphic novel. 
um, about a world where all the men have died except for why the last man. Okay. Um, and, you know, is it different when, you know, oh, everything would be different if women were in charge? Well, let's see. Uh, Diane Lane's the lead of that. And um, I'm just looking forward to kind of digging into the story world there. It's just, it, I've just got the script. It's amazing. So look for that. This could be another FX show. Right. Um, so, yeah, it's, 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 um, I'm having a really great time. Um, and, and, you know, being paired with shows that really kind of are working with, you know, things that I care about from, sure. you know, um, Lovecraft to, uh, you know, Umbrella and having this magical moment with, you know, Elliot, as well as the rest of the cast. It's like, how did you get through the last year? I mean, professionally and personally, how was um, I, you know, I took that, you know, time to, I was traveling all over and shooting all over. And then in March, I just wrapped uh, on a show in LA and got back and was about to go off somewhere in like a couple, like four or five days. And then I just had to stop. So mm -hmm. it allowed me to kind of stop and take a breather and sure. stop traveling and just kind of put myself back together and think about things and be at my home and be with my wife and kids and um, um, my pets and, and things of that nature. Uh, but uh, by September, I was back on the road again in a mask shooting. Oh, so wow. I've been, been on the road for a good chunk of time now. So okay. Okay. this series is Pride. It's on FX right now. It will soon be on FX on Hulu. It is absolutely amazing. Cheryl, it has been my honor and pleasure to talk to you. You are so iconic in our, in our community. Oh, Thank you for all so your are you. <laughs> Thank you so much. You have a great day. You're welcome so much. And enjoy everyone. I'll see you at the movies. Thanks so much, Cheryl.